Hey, this is Paul from Twist and Shout, and welcome to another episode of Vinyl University. Um, we haven't done one of these in a while, but uh, this is our ongoing web series where uh, we talk about <clears throat> various uh, aspects of collecting and appreciating vinyl records as opposed to uh, CDs or any other format. <clears throat> vinyl has made an enormous comeback in the last decade um, and is the main uh, format that we sell music on here at Twist and Shout again as it was in the early days. So, you know, we've seen an, a huge influx of new collectors and young people who don't always know what all the terms that we use mean. So we're trying to educate and welcome people into this great hobby. Today we're going to talk about something very interesting and very important and probably not understood that well. Mono versus stereo. Um, this is uh, refers to both a recording process and a uh, kind of a pressing process or the way the final product comes out. Um, when you record music you set up a microphone and the microphone becomes what's called a channel. It, uh, you set up a, um, in the early days of recording music they would you'd have a huge band, an orchestra or something and there would often be one microphone right in the middle recording that music and uh, it would come through one channel. That is a pure mono channel, also called monaural or monophonic. Um, the, the, and it doesn't have to be one channel. Mono can be recorded on multi channels. When we record music in the modern era, now every instrument gets its own microphone. The drums will get multiple microphones, one for the cymbals, one for the tom-tom, one for the kick drum, all, all the different, you know, guitar player, the vocals, everybody now gets their own microphone. With a mono mix, even if you have multiple channels, the point of a mono mix is to pan everything to the middle. That's the idea of a mono mix. It's uh, as if you are sitting in the middle and the sound stage, which is an idea of how the music plays out in your head and make where, where it feels like it is in front of you. That's called the sound stage. So in a mono mix, it feels like it's all right there in the middle, like the, all the music has been pushed there. In an attempt, you know, when in the early days of music, when they were recording orchestras and stuff, people recognized that, well, all the music is right here in the middle, but when I go to the orchestra, I hear, you know, drums over here and woodwinds over here and horns, you know, in, in the back and this, you know, and maybe an opera singer in the front, and it really, there is a bigger sound stage. So, stereo was an attempt to reproduce that, to take the music from all pan to the middle to making more of a wide field sound stage. And that's the fundamental difference between mono and stereo. With stereo, it is using a bunch of electronic tricks, and I don't use that term in a negative sense, but it uses a bunch of tricks to fool your mind into thinking you're hearing this big wide sound stage and reproducing it. Because remember, you know, the music is really coming out of, you know, one or two sources, one speaker or two speakers. If you have a quad system or a surround system, then it's coming out of more. But as an aside, both quad and surround are essentially versions of stereo. It's it's your machine fooling your mind into thinking there's music all around me um, instead of being panned right to the middle. Um, so that's the fundamental difference between mono and stereo. <clears throat> Why does it matter? And this is the more important thing. The, the, the heyday of mono recording was essentially everything was in mono until um, 
the late 50s, early 60s when Stereophonic was introduced and it started to become a fad. People heard it and were very excited by it. And in America, even before in the UK, um, the uh, engineers really started, um, the recording engineers, embracing stereo. And it, it happened more quickly in America, even more quickly in Germany. Germany was the first country to stop making mono records. But in America, um, you know, the uh, stereo got introduced and then you had both. And I certainly remember uh, early in my buying career, my dad had a mono um, hi-fi and mono records were cheaper and than stereo records. And it was kind of like having color TV versus black and white. I remember him saying, no, the mono ones are cheaper. Our hi-fi is for mono. It sounds better in mono. It's I'm gonna I'm not gonna go with this stereo thing. So really, mono was the de facto kind of music that everybody purchased and listened to. Where it matters is in the late 50s, mid to late 50s, and early 60s, when there was a whole generation of engineers and producers and guys who really understood recording in mono, such as the man who recorded all the Blue Note records, Rudy Van Gelder. He recorded uh, early on in um, both mono and stereo, but his mono mixes are very uh, desirable <clears throat> because he, when he would remix, when he mixed the albums down, he would just listen on one speaker and he mixed everything for that mono punch, that loud punch. It's only started mattering Stereo only became preferable in the 60s when the engineers started really understanding that you could do very exciting things with stereo. And George Martin, um, the guy who produced the Beatles, was one of the first guys who really, really understood uh, the value of stereo and that you could do things that you couldn't do with mono. Interestingly though, <clears throat> George Martin like all of the guys from that era, grew up doing mono, and he would do two discrete mixes, of one mono mix, one stereo mix, and they would both get released. To collectors, many of those, he, he on both the White Album and Sgt. Pepper's, he put more work into the mono. He worked on those first, and he worked harder on them, and they're very desirable. When you listen to them A, B, first the mono, then the stereo, or vice versa, <clears throat> they're really different. Uh, you can really hear a difference. And for instance, Sgt. Pepper is uh, just a far more ornate and interesting uh, mix in mono. However, it's also an album that benefits hugely from stereo because there's so many effects in a rooster crowing over here or guitar coming just out there or orchestra tuning up on Sgt. Pepper. So they really are different and they really are interesting and it's really worth seeking them both out. Where it becomes interesting is um, in that era when they were making them both. People seek out mono records for a couple of different reasons. One, they started making fewer of them so they're rarer, they're collectible. Two, as I mentioned, they would often do a different mix, and so you have alternate mixes or different, a different take sometimes, or even the vocals or the uh, horn or the guitar will be in a different place or louder, or just you get a completely different feel for the music. Um, and then in, as they really started phasing mono out <clears throat> in the uh, late 60s, around 1968 in America, um, they became rare. Uh, they, there were very few of them. So there's a collectible factor, there is a sound factor, and for me, the reason I collect mono, and the only things I collect on mono are things from, you know, the late 50s through the mid 60s, and the things I collect are like Blue Note jazz records, um, because they have a uh, uh, because he originally recorded them in mono, they have a just a de facto, to my ears, 
punchier, louder sound. Um, the music is uh, more present, uh, bass is louder, horns are, you know, the treble is, um, it just has a greater presence that you can almost feel when it comes out of the speakers. <clears throat> also, as I mentioned, you know, on these Beatles records, you know, the mono and stereo are truly different, and as a collectible uh, matter, you know, mono is often a lot harder to get, although certain ones people much prefer the stereo. So, <clears throat> I guess to sum up, I mean, mono is still used in our society. Any, any uh, hearing aid, any telephone, all that's mono. There's no stereo there. <clears throat> but now, any modern recording pretty much de facto benefits from a stereo mix because there's a lot more you can do with the music. Now there's many, many tracks on a, on a mixing board, you know, 24, 48, whatever, you can, you can go to, it's almost unlimited the amount of music you can put on into a song now. In the old days there wasn't, there was only so many tracks they could do. So if you're interested in mono, seek out old recordings from the 50s and 60s, early jazz, early pop that are mono recordings where it was actually mixed and recorded in mono. Anything past that, <clears throat> it's more of a collectible thing. It's just because it's rare. Um, I like those early rock albums, the Kinks, the Stones, the Who, the Beatles, <clears throat> because a lot of them were Record, the, the engineers and the band themselves understood everything in mono. They played everything very simply. There were very few instruments and it just has a punchier, it belongs in the middle. When you actually saw the Beatles at the Cavern Club, they were standing just a few inches from each other. Everything was in the middle and it's an accurate representation of what the music sounded like. Once things, once recording technique really started going in the mid 60s, <clears throat> and they had multiple tracks and orchestras and everything else, stereo truly is the way to go. So I hope this kind of gives you uh, an understanding of what the difference between stereo and mono are and what the value is in finding certain mono recordings. It's not for everything, it's for certain things. And for those early jazz recordings, for early rock recordings, it's stunning. Um, when you go get into classical and things like that, it benefits so much from stereo and modern recordings and things like Pink Floyd and you know Jimmy later Jimi Hendrix records. They they just benefit so much from that wide field stereo sound stage. So hopefully this will get you going on mono and stereo. Um, and if you have any further questions feel free to come in and talk to us about it. We all understand it and have feelings about it. Everybody has their own feelings about it, but that's the fun of collecting. So for Twist and Shout and Vinyl University, this has been Paul, and I'll see you next time.